and talk about that. And without further ado, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome to Mon uh, Wednesday. We're in Wednesday. I can't believe we're in Wednesday already. Time is like, <laughs> oh, where did the time go? So welcome. Thank you for tuning in uh, to join us on Wednesday. This is Live Coffee Talk. This is the show where I bring, invite a lot of guests to talk about love, courage, and connection. So every week you can expect um, <clears throat> a really special guest to talk about their tra personal transformational journey and how they show up in their life with these three values, love, courage, and connection. And today I have a very, very adorable, charming woman and her name is Genesis. Uh, Genesis Camp, she is a creative content writer author, self-development advocate, visionary, inclusion and diversity and enthusiast, and firecracker. I love that word firecracker, <laughs> a force not to be reckoned with. Um, Genesis is a woman of color who said enough is enough. And it's now boarding, uh, bolder than ever. So this, she is definitely speaking courage. When I bring her on, you're gonna meet her. And it's, she's just very uh, inspiring. She tried to remain quiet, but that didn't work out because no change ever occurred. Today, she is uh, readapting to the current, th current time and making some life-changing decisions. She is stepping outside of her comfort zone by speaking up, challenging the status quo, and refusing to let limitation place on her, keeping her down. Genesis sees herself as a visionary and as a woman who will go on to do great things that empowers others to speak up for themselves. Yes, it may be hard, yet it, it may hurt, but in the long run, she desires to be uh, encouraging others to help those who may not have a voice. Um, I don't want to take too much of time uh, from from hearing her voice. So without further ado, I want to bring her onto the screen. Hi, Genesis. Hello, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from <laughs> with all these time zones. I'm so grateful to be here and thank you so much for having me on live coffee talk. <laughs> yeah i when i when i first connected with you and i i was just really amazed by your your voice and there's something about your voice that really tells me that you are a woman of courage um you know usually when i meet people you you hear that soft voice and you know oh you know thank you so much for inviting me but no there you are you stand for what you stand for you're like listen, I'm really a great fit for your show. So you should be inviting me and here you are. <laughs> I guess that's the firecracker in me. <laughs> yeah, and I love that about people because I truly believe that if you firmly believe that you are a great fit for whether it's a job, a position, a role that you're gonna go on um, or an interview that you, want, you would like to be on, you have to be adamant, you have to be assertive and just telling people, hey, I think we're, we're going to be a great match and I, I can bring value to your show. So this is why you should be inviting me. So I'd, tell, tell us about yourself. How, because you, you, you publish a book. Tell us about your book. Yes, so my book, Chocolate Drop in Corporate America, From the Pit to the Palace, was published on May 27, 2020, and everyone knew uh, that 2020 threw us for a curveball. It was something that it literally felt like it was out of a movie, but I am so grateful that my book came out when it did, because shortly after my book came out, the whole Black Lives Matter movement started, so a lot of people were really talking about inclusion and diversity, and it was just so such a coincidence that, okay, here's my book, and then here's people really advocating for inclusion and diversity, not just for Black and Brown people, but anyone that can um, consider themselves a minority, whether it's a person with disabilities that are physical disabilities or invisible disabilities, whether it's the LGBTQ community, whether it's the working mothers that are repatriating back into the workforce, those are all different buckets of minorities in a sense, depending on what industry you're in. So um, 
the movement really just shook people up and it got people to be more bold and more courageous to really come out and share their stories because prior to that, people were really talking amongst themselves in their groups of people. Whereas, you know, your group that you're part of can only go so far, but it's so important that we partner with allies to help us convey the message upwards to people who don't necessarily look like us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's just amazing. I'm also first generation American. So just having parents that are foreigners come over to America because they want the American dream, but then you see them having to work twice as hard due to the color of their skin. That really just shook me, but then it also helped help shape me to the woman I am because I'm not gonna let limitations and barriers keep me from achieving my, my goals and my dreams because I believe that we all have gifts and talents that are inside of us. So we have to practice self-care and self-awareness and really create a path for ourselves and stop waiting on other people to validate who we are. Mm -hmm. I, I love how, you know, there's coincidence. I, I, I personally don't, I, I believe the universe works by a synchronicity. So there's things that we do in our life and suddenly the event will just come and meet where we are. And it sounds like Black Lives Matter really was a, a synchronicity to what you were already doing before the event actually happened. And it just so happened that you published the book and the, the incident happened. Um, so I'm curious, what inspired you to, to write this book in the first place? Uh, well, the book really started out of frustration. I had a healthy disagreement <laughs> with my supervisor around performance review time. She pretty much was giving me feedback that I wasn't receptive to because I know my worth and I know the quality of work that I produce. And she pretty much told me, oh, no, you're not going to be converted to the MPT, which is managerial, professional, and technical bucket. I don't think that you're able to compete with the professionals and just all this negative stuff. But yet I was doing the work of a professional in the group for three years, but they had me categorized as an admin, which falls into the office clerical administrat administration bucket. But I had a four year degree. I got my degree in supply chain and logistics technology, and I have double minors. So one in purchasing, and one in organizational leadership and supervision. Plus I had a work experience prior to working at this for Fortune 500 company. I started with a smaller corrosion company that was mom and pop and it was ran by people from the UK. So I did not see any disparity whenever it came to race or disparity whenever it came to my pay. But it wasn't until I left that company because I really wanted to advance my career because I was already at the top of where, you know, I could go with that smaller company. So when I left and I jumped into the big pond at this Fortune 500 company, it was literally like I was starting all over again. And I'm like, this is not what I signed up for. Like out of the three job offers I had, it was the lowest paying job but i took the job because i saw the brand of the company and that brand was around for a long time so it's like okay i could be branded by association and this company has great credibility they have longevity and etc so that's the reason why i signed on board but had i know had i known what i know now i probably would have never accepted you know the job offer with that company but you know sometimes in life we just have to take what is thrown at us and really pivot and turn the negatives into a positive in order for us to keep our sanity mm -hmm. at, at what point so i'm curious and this might be a little controversial to a lot of people and and i'm glad we're talking about it because this needs to be heard and because we've been uh, personally, I'm, I'm the same as you, you know, my parents came from a different country, I wasn't even born here. Um, so there was a lot of struggle as someone who's a, a woman of color, uh, gender inequality, right. And so that that just that just by default, people immediately think you are a woman, you know, I highly doubt you can you're capable of doing my job. Right. So there's that default, but people don't talk about it and people don't have any uh, standards or measuring it. Oh, well, this, you know, she didn't hit this point and therefore she doesn't qualify. So at what point did you, that made you realize that you weren't getting what you, what you deserved? 
So it was in a meeting that we had, I think it was like a global meeting and they flashed up the CL levels on the screen and CL is classification levels where you see what people in the group start with and what the maximum potential is. So it said 22 to 28 and I'm like, wait a minute, like my CL's not up there. So my CL at the time was a 15. So I was like, you could see the big disparity between a 15 to a 22. So you, I'm at a 15, but the group starts at a 22, but yet I am doing the work similar to my peers, I'm traveling for the company, I'm representing the company to global distributors, third party service providers, traveling, and etc. And most of the time, administrative assistants, what they had me categorize as don't travel for the company, they don't use the company car service, they don't have a corporate Amex card or anything like that. And so I was like, something is wrong with this picture. So it was in that moment. It was like a turning point. I already knew that I was being slighted, but once you saw the evidence there, you could see, okay, there is a problem here and I really need to do more to get justice for myself and not just for me, but also those young people that are going to be coming besides and behind me. Because if I don't take a stand now, then how are they going to treat the other um, black and brown people or the other minorities that want to work for this company. So sometimes we have to be the forerunners and we may not necessarily see our impact until later on. But as long as we are bold and courageous, then we know that we're making an impact. And if you could just touch one life, then you've done your part because you don't know who that one person is going to go on to influence. I love that. And I think the whole point of speaking up, it has to do with, you know, this is what I was going through. And I don't want other people to have to gone through the same experience. And if I don't speak up, if I remain to be the victim and stop taking action, not, no change will happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a choice between making a change, um, whether it's for the good or the bad, at least we spoke up. And so how long did it did it take you to write the book? It took me two months to write the book, so I would. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I thought so. I wrote my book in four months. I thought I was fast enough. People were like, "What? Four months?" I just oh, like... God, two months. <laughs> you just beat me. <laughs> it's only a hundred and two pages, though, and I would write after I got home from work. And the caveat was I didn't even have a laptop when I wrote my book. So I wrote my entire book on my cell phone. Oh my God. <laughs> I have the same cell phone. So I put it on a notes app. <laughs> hey, if you have something to say and it needs to come out, you're going to find a way to let it come out, be heard, regardless of the method, right? Whether you have a laptop or a cell phone, it doesn't matter. It needs to be heard. You had a very important message to share. So there it is, two months publishing a book. Uh, viewer, please, those of you who are still thinking about taking action, here's your perfect example of how to take action and make, make shit happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so just never let like your resources limit you never let, you know, your stinking thinking limit you because we have the tools everyone has a cell phone, and you can easily download a notes app and just get writing, or you could you know, kick it old school and pull out a notepad and a pen and write it down. Like there's a staple scripture that um, I kind of live by it's write the vision and make it plain because when you write things down you hold yourself accountable and then you start to see that okay this is what I wrote down then then you reflect on it and you're like oh my gosh this actually manifested like I can I am doing this now and it's just so amazing because like you could see the transformation and had you not wrote it down like how are you measuring yourself Exactly. I love everything you just said. Like, just write this shit down. Paper, <laughs> electronic, just put it down on paper. Um, so, so where are you now? Like, after you published a book, did you get any pressure from the company for from your peer? So some people at the company don't know that I published the book, which is good. Um, but after the book came out, we had a forum 
with those of us that identified as Black or African American with our vice president of supply chain. And he called on different people to speak. And then some people volunteered. So I was one of the ones he called on. And by that point, I was like, enough is enough. Like, I have nothing to lose. Like, I'm going to be unapologetically me and share. So his question was, have you experienced racism in a professional or personal setting? And I had experienced it in both. So I talked about the fact that I have um, biracial nieces and nephews. So two of them are half Caucasian and the other two are half Indian. And when I was in the grocery store, one day with the ones that are half Caucasian, someone came up to me and asked, whose kids are those? Like, I wasn't responsible to be with kids that look completely white or don't look black. And I'm like, seriously, it's 2020 and this ignorance is still taking place. So I was like, okay, I had to really think quickly on my toes because I live in Texas, which is a red state and very conservative. So the... <laughs> the situation could have went south real quick. So I was like, excuse me. And I just kind of played it off. And I said, these are my nieces and nephew, not that it's any of your business. And yes, I'm responsible to be with them. And then I really got a glimpse of reality that, okay, even though I live in a nice area and I'm at the nice Kroger, the super sized Kroger's or whatever you call it, it's like some people are still ignorant and they can't adapt to the fact that there are mixed races, that not everyone may look like them, or the world is changing, so society is changing, and etc. And I was like, I just had to shake it off because you can't help someone that is so close-minded, and you just can't help their ignorance because it's not a reflection of you, but it's a reflection of that person and who they are. It reflects on their characteristics and if you want to be, you know, that type of person, then don't expect to go that far in life because you're limiting yourself from endless possibilities because you're judging someone based on how they look and appear. And their appearance has nothing to do with how they're going to perform, how they're going to treat you, and et cetera. And just because someone may be Black or African American does not make that person the same as everyone in the Black race. And that one Black person is not the token for the entire Black or African-American race. Mm -hmm. And so that happened. So I shared that story. Then I shared about the work side. I was like, okay, I started with this company in 2013 as an administrative assistant. Coincidentally, you guys are still paying me as an administrative assistant seven years later, but then I'm representing your company and your brand in order you know, in order to bring in revenue to make your company look good. I'm going, I'm traveling to different places. I'm representing your, your brand, talking about inventory control, talking about metrics, KPIs, which are key performance indicators to C-suite executives, but yet you still don't value me or you don't want to pay me what I'm worth. And I kid you not, a week after I shared all the things I shared, I got a 20% increase in my pay. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm grateful for the 20% increase. Don't get me wrong. But did you just give me the increase because I spoke up in a meeting that had um, about 30 people or less that identified as Black and African American. One of the people were HR, who was non-Black. Then there was two supervisors that that were Black and two managers that were Black. Did you do that because I was bold and everyone kind of knew the back end? Or did you do it because you're trying to clean up act and show the shareholders, okay, we are inclus inclusive and diverse, and this is how we're helping our Black and African American people. Did you do it for that? Because I was like, it's just so weird that prior to that, I had a conversation with my manager that said I wasn't good enough to compete in the MPT role. I wasn't going to get a pay increase in about two years and I wasn't going to get a new role. But then after I had the conversation with upper management in the VP's meeting, boom, a 20% salary increase. So what is it? Did you genuinely do it? Or did you do it to save face and check a box? Mm, yeah. 
it, it really surprised me. And, and going through what we had experienced in 2020 in Black Lives Matter, I think it brought up a lot of issue in terms of um, how the, the, the world, the whole entire state is so divided. And there are people who embrace every culture, embrace how unique our country is versus those who um, kind of just living in their own bubble and just shoveling things that really, it's been here for a while, ladies and gentlemen, and how we're so um, caught up with our own thoughts that we don't believe that these are issues. Um, I kid you not. So I had a conversation uh, years ago and, and there was a, I, so I had one of my colleagues, she was born here, she was raised here. Um, she grew up here. So she considered herself as black. And there's a distinction between you don't call, call someone black or African American, they're not interchangeable. And, and people heard <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing now because you know exactly what I mean, right? People were pointing to someone and say, oh, that's an African American. No, she's black. <laughs> And the yeah. word just create a lot of uh, connotation around. Oh, I don't want to call her black, but you no, know, you want to you want to refer her her ethnicity as black because that's what she is. <laughs> that's why I call myself a chocolate drop because so many people are like, I'm not black or I'm not African American because my parents aren't from Africa. I wasn't born in Africa, and I'm like, seriously, I'm like, guys, it's just a label. It's not defining who you are. It's just a way of categorizing the race. And I'm like, okay. So then that's why I was like, you know what? I'm chocolate. Just I, I was like, mm, I'm sweet like Hershey's, but I don't want to say Hershey kiss because I don't want to be sued by the Hershey company. So I'm like, I'm a chocolate drop and I work in corporate America. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect title for the book. Uh, hold, hold up your book. Show us your book. Yep. There you are, the chocolate drop in corporate America. And you see the cover. The cover is very intentional because there's a world in the background to let people know that corporate um corporate issues as well as issues in general can happen worldwide, whether they're discrimination, whether it's systemic racism, or whether it's just an issue that is just beyond our control. It can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. Then there's people that are on the book cover that are from different industries as well as different ethnicities to really promote inclusion and diversity because it starts with all of us coming together to build partnership with each other and to help one another because we can't do it alone. We need other people to partner their assets and skills with us in order for us to create an environment that is conducive, that is extraordinary, and where we could really show what collaboration is. Because if you think about all the people that went before us that are now billionaires, they didn't get to their billionaire status alone. They had someone in IT, they had someone in sales, they had someone that was the face of the company and et cetera. Think about Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, all of those people. And then the subtitle is from the pit to the palace. So sometimes you have to go through dark seasons in life in order for you to appreciate your palace once you get there. It's those dark seasons and those dark moments that help you realize like, I am stronger than I look. Like as long as I condition my mindset to a part, to a part of me as well as a part of around me to feed in positive energy that I could take that positive energy and go so much further because your mindset could be shifted between good or bad. But if you keep putting in deposits that are positive, that are optimistic, that are building you up, that are strengthening you, imagine what your seed is going to produce once it harvests. So it's like they say, you reap what you sow, you sow good seeds, good will come back to you. If you reap negative seeds, you're gonna get negative in return. So we really have to shift our stinking thinking and stop allowing 
the external forces, whether it's society, whether it's people who don't see our value to control us. Because once we allow other things to control us, then it's also crippling us. Mm -hmm. So beautifully said. (laughs) I I, I also believe, you know, I kind of want to echo to that. And by saying you, you sow what you seed, right? Mm -hmm. And so be intentional in what you plant in your life. So plant it with the sea of inspiration, love, courage, then the outcome is a complete different picture. So uh, I'm really curious, what does inclusion and diversity? Oh, yes. (laughs) So (laughs) diversity is when you have a group of people from different ethnic backgrounds, different cultures, different religions, and etc. That's where the diversity is. Inclusion is when you make those people who are different feel included, and they feel welcome, they feel like, okay, I have a place here, I deserve to be here, and I am seen, but I'm also heard. So whenever you think about inclusivity, okay, are the working mothers included in the workforce? Do they have a rightful place, like when they come back to work? Like some companies don't have a mother's room, and there's uh, women that are coming back from maternity leave, and they may, may want to, you know, pump their breast milk and store it in a place. So create a place for them to go, you know, pump their breast milk. Okay, are the people who have a different sexual orientation, are they being included or are they looking at are, or are they being look, looked down on because, you know, they identified differently sexually? Because if they don't feel included, you know, then that's also something that is stripping away from the corporation because your corporation is not open-minded. We're not saying that we condone your behavior, but everyone is entitled to their own lifestyle and them having a different sexual orientation is not going to stop them from performing and excelling in their job. So you have to definitely take away that label. Then people who have disabilities, whether they are physical disabilities or invisible uh, disabilities, do they have the necessary means? Like if they're in a wheelchair, are there ramps in the corporation to help them get there, um, get to certain places? Do they have, you know, lower sinks? Do they have uh, lower toilets and et cetera? That's part of making sure that they are included in the workforce, as well as, okay, when we talk about, you know, different ERG groups, which are employee resource groups, are there a group where they can go talk about the issues that they are facing and they can actually be heard. Are the people listening to understand what the RCA is, the root cause analysis to help them? Because if you have diversity, but you don't have inclusion, then I I personally believe that it's not going to work. You have to have both. And then some companies have E squared, which is equality and equity, where you're making sure those people are treated equally. Okay, if they're doing the same role, like for example, you have a buyer in procurement and you have two, one is Caucasian and one is black. They have the same exact job description and et cetera. Are they both being paid equally? If not, then that's not really helping with equality because there's a difference. Then you have equity. Equity is so important. You can't have equity without equality or without inclusion and diversity. You really need all components in order for your corporation or business to thrive because those people whenever they come to work, if they feel included, if they feel like their value, they're going to go above and beyond to ensure they're doing their work and they're doing their work to the best of their ability, plus more. They're going to want to be at work. They're going to be happy. They're going to, you know, offer ideas and et cetera, because they're like, okay, I'm not just a token, or I'm not just here for the company to check the box to show that they're inclusive and diverse, but the company actually cares about me and my values and how my values mirror with the company's mission statement and core. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it that way, everyone is going to be in a win-win situation where they're able to thrive. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, the way that I, I, I am trained as a coach, as a leadership coach, is through the energy leadership. And energy leadership came from uh, Bruce Schneider, who is the founder of IPAC Coaching. Um, so he has a book, it's called Energy Leadership. And those, uh, those of you who are in the corporate world or in the company or in business generally, just period, um, just read that book. It's really a great book, Energy Leadership. And behind that energy leadership, there's a concept of um, we all show up, you know, whether you're a leader, you're a business owner, women, men, we all show up as leaders. And the way that we lead is how we interact with others. And that comes with our energy. If you're someone who has a higher level of energy, then ten you tend to be more optimistic. You welcome people, you incorporate people. Whereas if you're coming from a more negative uh, energy, then, you know, you're always about who to blame, who, you know, this project didn't work out, who do I need to, uh, you know, talk to, or who, which employee is clocking in and out late. So, um, <laughs> right, behind those concepts, there's an idea of a lot of entrepreneurs will, will um, exhibit this energy of win-win, creating that win-win situation, but they're all focusing on, you know, what's in it for me. Whereas um, I believe a really sustainable society and even in, within the company, a sustainable company, it, people need to start having that mindset of incorporating all the talent so that we can create something that is sustainable. And by incorporating everybody inclusive and diversity, what you end up doing is you're, you're, you're pulling in all these skills, all these talent from all, every single individual to create a society, a community that can sustain in the long term. So that's how I was trained. And as you're talking about this inclusion, inclusion and, and diversity, I'm thinking, wow, that's you know, it's it's amazing just looking back to my experience in the corporate, in the in the workforce. You can tell which leaders are going to um, be around for a long time and those who aren't going to be around for a long time because they haven't developed that mindset. Um, I, I can I can tell you a story about how, you know, because you talked about including, include, including those who are disabled. And I remember um, this is a story that uh, someone else had told me after I got hired by my by my current uh, workplace. My previous uh, CEO of the department, after he hired me, he bust out, open the door, and he announced it to everybody. Everybody, we need to buy a step stool because I just hired a short pe short person. <laughs> so, oh yes. Well, it, I took it in two ways. One can say, well, how inappropriate to call someone short, right? The other way I took it was how amazing this person can see, and he was already thinking about how to make my job easier. So I believe his intention was the latter one. I want to make her job easier because I just hired her and I believe her talent. And so he looked beyond my physical differences and he was thinking ahead in how can I make her job easier by having a step stool. Yeah, I, I think that's why I stay around for this long. Um, yeah, so later on, it's a different story. <laughs> I'm getting burned out from, from work for a different reason now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's good that you're recognizing when you're getting burnt out because that's a part of self-care and self-awareness because sometimes people forget that we spend the majority of our time at work. So I ask people, okay, how much longer are you going to build someone else's empire up when you can take that same amount of energy and build your own empire to leave a legacy for future generations to come? Because even though you're working for a company, you could still be working on your personal brand outside of the company because I feel like jobs can come and go and we're replaceable to an extent. So you really can't put all your eggs in one basket. You really have to have a holistic approach and see the bigger picture. Because after I got the 20% increase, a few months later, um, my, you know, my dad was sick. So I was 
at home working from home so I could help with, you know, my dad and et cetera. Then in November, the day before Thanksgiving, he passed away. Then a week after my dad passed away, they told me that I was being laid off. So there were so many events that happened in 2020. And I was like, okay, it's a good thing that, you know, I have the book to fall back on because now I could really coach and really talk about inclusion and diversity, what it is. I definitely want to help younger people because they are the future to go into different schools to really talk about inclusion and diversity, how to celebrate other people's differences, how to have open discussions to ask about other people's cultures and religions or their viewpoints because you may not understand where they're coming from, but if you take a step back to peel the onion layers back and really dive into who that person is, what some of their morals are, and how you could build a rapport with that person that is mutually beneficial, then you're already, you know, pushing the envelope in a sense in the right direction. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'm grateful for the seven and a half years because I'll be let go this coming February, so mid-February. And, you know, se those seven and a half years, I gained, you know, training with the company. I met some great people. I also have connections outside of the company. So I take all of those as positives and wins. And then with my dad passing, I was like, okay, he's no longer in pain. He's no longer suffering. And now I have a spiritual angel to help guide me along the way. Yes, I miss my dad and I wish he was here, but I know, you know, maybe there was another calling for him in the afterlife or whatever, whatever. But I'm just so grateful that I got to spend, you know, those months with him at home caring for him or when he was at the hospital and et cetera, because that's time you won't be able to get back. So you have to really celebrate people while they're in your life and don't wait till, you know, the funeral comes or the graveyard to cry. You have to give people their flowers while they can bloom. I'm so sorry to hear about your father. Um, the first time we were talking, it was talking outside the hospital. <clears throat> and I, I remember we didn't have a really good connection and you look exhausted. You really look exhausted at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. And it makes perfect sense. And, and I'm really glad that you got the time to spend with him. And yeah, I'll just leave it at that because I, I know you're probably still going through that, you know, grieving process yeah but oh my gosh the timing with this job couldn't have sucked more because I'm like you wait a week after my dad passes to tell me that I won't have a job come mid-February and I'm like okay and I'm like I'm just so done and she's like oh you're taking it very well as opposed to how do you want me to be the angry black woman and be like you're firing me like, you're letting me go <laughs> like no I'm like okay when one door closes another one is going to open so I was like okay thank you I appreciate it and just hung up because I have other things to think about I have to plan a funeral I have to make sure my mom's okay you know <laughs> yeah yeah I was gonna say congratulations from finally leaving that corporate job that wasn't very inspiring it almost felt like really draining right so now you can focus on something even more positive more more um uh, uplifting that actually you can make impact in the world so what plans do you have coming up so I recently wrote another chapter um, called 2020. So it's going to be chapter 13 that I'm going to include in the book. So uh, the title is so funny. It's 2020 far from um, perfect vision, but a slap of reality. So that's going to be <laughs> included in the book. I'm also going to work on a workbook to go along with the book. So that part, I haven't started. I have the thoughts in my head. I just need to get them onto paper. But the new chapter is in production. I sent it off to the publisher. She sent me her edits back. So she's going to reformat the book and et cetera. And then another thing I really want to do is turn my book into an audio book where I'm reading my book myself because a lot of people have asked me, hey, is this an is this an audio? And I'm like, no, but it can be in my voice. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I need to, um, I'm doing my research in some Facebook groups that I'm a part of to see what type of software do you need for the audio, because it needs to really be crisp with no distractions, no background noise in order for certain um, companies to accept it like Audible and et cetera. So definitely having to do my due diligence there. It sounds amazing. I'm like, I can't wait to, uh, to first of all, read your book. Where can I, where can I get one? So the book is available on Amazon, the, the current book, for $13 in paperback. There's a Kindle version as well for $2.99. And then for people who are part of Kindle Unlimited, the book is free of charge since they pay a membership. I'm in two bookstores currently. So Book Mecca, and that's M-E-C-C-A, and Shelves Bookstore. And I'm hoping to be in more brick and mortar stores. I would love to see my book on the shelves of Barnes and Nobles or Books, Books a Million or whatever. <laughs> vision. We have to create that vision, right? You're manifesting that. Yes. And I definitely want to do some speaking again, um, more speaking events. Like, so partner with different conferences where they have inclusion and diversity panelists or um, school events where I'm really teaching the kids on what what they should look for, as well as asking them the question, hey, who do you want to be when you grow up versus what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I feel like the who is more important than the what. And we need to channel that into the young kids because sometimes they say, oh, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer because that's what their parents want for them. But that's not what they actually want to do or what they're passionate about. So, you know, the who is like, you know, part of your morals, your values, your characteristics. And I think that will take you so much further in life than just a what, because a what is a label that keeps you and confinement. Beautiful. So with that, I wanted to wrap up the show by saying, who did you want to grow up to be? <laughs> so at first, I didn't know who. It was the what. So I've always wanted to be a pediatrician. So anyone that asked me, I was like, oh, I want to be a pediatrician because I love kids. And But now the who I want to be is I want to be a woman of influential power. I want to be a woman that is not afraid to say what's on my mind, what whether it's good or bad, but I'm expressing like what some of my desires are or what I'm feeling, because I think it's so important that we embrace our feelings because if we internalize it, then it's not a healthy way of living. I wanna be a New York Times bestseller author. <laughs> yes. And, and I definitely want to create a space by being a woman that is approachable where people could come up to me and they could say, hey, I heard you on this podcast or I saw you on this TV show and really be that relatable person that has inspiration, motivation and encouragement to help people you know, get out of that rut and overcome that rat race. And a mother someday, like I don't have little bambinos yet. So <laughs> hoping for a little baby um, so I could be a great mother. And so that's part of me and I'm still figuring it out. So I tell people I am an imperfect person working on being a better version of myself daily. So as I go through life's journey, my who is going to still be defined along the way. I don't wanna limit myself and say, this is all I want to be, or this is all I, all who I want to be or whatever. So I'm definitely leaving it wide open because I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And like when I have these fluid conversations with people like you, Michelle, you get to know yourself a little bit more because you're deep diving and I'm having fun talking to you. It doesn't seem like, oh, stuffy. It's like, oh, we're having this fluid conversation and we're impacting um, one another's lives and we're building rapport. And that rapport is going to create a long lasting friendship where we could pick up the phone and we could chat. Hey, I'm, ha I'm having this idea. Like, what do you think about? It? Or vice versa. And that's the type of environment that I want to create. Ah, oh, so beautiful. Is it okay if I share an idea for you as you're talking about your future who? <laughs> sure. So as you're describing your future who and who you want to be, right? Uh, maybe create, may, write it down on a list. And at the end of each 
will each who you want to be end it with yes. So oh, okay. saying yes, you are a woman, a voice, a woman creating impact. Yes to everything. I love that because it partners with my I am statement. Like I am a firecracker. I am black, bold, and beautiful. I am courageous. And like whenever I say my I am statements, it builds like confidence. And then you start to hold hold your back up. You hold your your head up high and you're walking it like you're talking it because sometimes people need to know who they are. And so those I am statements can partner with who you are. Absolutely. Oh, so beautiful. Hashtag authenticity. <laughs> That's one of my biggest uh, thing is authenticity. I truly believe when we're being authentic and, and meeting our true authentic self, then we have this enormous amount of power to really be who we are. And it doesn't matter what we do, the who will just stand out and that who is going to become your self-motivation to move forward, to do everything that you wanted to do and make it actually level up to bring it up a notch. So I really believe in uh, authenticity and you just gave a perfect example of someone who is genuinely authentic self. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate like just sitting here and chatting with you. Yeah, I, I'm having a, su such a good time. We actually uh, did this interview in 45 minutes, but you know, <laughs> I'm loving it. I'm loving it. And I love, because a lot of uh, my, my connection, I don't, I build connection. And this is a message that I want people to walk away with is that you build connection, not transactions. I don't want my guests to just come into the show and, and share what they have to share and, and just really, it really just disappear, right? I want them to continue to be here that's inspire each other moving forward. And, you know, that have friends who call me or to text me, hey, Michelle, I need help. How do you do the live? And I would jump onto the call. So things are not transactional. It's actually building connection. So beautifully said. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Genesis, for coming to the show. Where can people find you? So I'm on Facebook as Genesis, that's G-E-N-E-S-I-S, -E -S Amaris, A-M-A-R-I-S, Kemp, K-E-M-P. I have an author page under Chocolate Drop in Corporate America. You could reach me via email at genesisamariskemp at gmail.com. And yes, it's me. I respond to all my emails. And I'm also on Instagram under one of my other brands, which is at Lady D Richardson, and that's R I C H A R D S O N. I will have all the links in the episode notes so that people will remember to follow you <laughs> and check you out. Chocolate drops in corporate America. One more time. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. All right, everybody, welcome. Well, no, thank you. <laughs> I, I'm having so much fun on this talk that I want to uh, continue this. Um, but unfortunately, I'm going to wrap it up. And thank you so much for watching. This is Wednesday Live Coffee Talk. And this is a show where I bring you inspiration. And hopefully, by hearing Genesis' story, you are going to start thinking about letting your voice to be heard, be seen, and be known. So join me next week at 8 o'clock Pacific time for another amazing show. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>